According to A.C. Bradley, a literary scholar specialising in Shakespeare, Shakespearean tragedy is characterised by a hero who has a tragic flaw, otherwise known as hamartia. This is an internal imperfection in an otherwise noble character that causes his downfall and which makes the unfolding of the events leading to his inevitable demise all the more tragic. In the case of Macbeth, it is his unchecked ambition which ultimately gets the better of him and takes him from a brave and esteemed warrior to a feared and despised murderous tyrant. When we first hear of Macbeth, we find out that he has just defeated the traitor Macdonald in bloody battle. The captain describes him as brave Macbeth, well he deserves that name. And King Duncan praises him, O valiant cousin, worthy gentleman. At this point in the play, Macbeth's future is bright as Duncan proposes to honour him with the Thanedom of Cawdor as a reward for his bravery and loyalty. Before Macbeth is able to receive this news and the further revelation that Malcolm is next in line for the crown, however, he has his first fateful meeting with the witches on the heath. The witches' propensity for making mischief is such that they choose a prophecy that will resonate with Macbeth's hamartia. Their proclamation, All hail Macbeth, thou shalt be king hereafter is specifically designed to awaken his dormant ambition, which it immediately and successfully does. Although he says in public, to be king stands not within the prospect of belief, as soon as he has a moment to reflect in private, while Banquo is conversing with Ross and Angus, he says in an aside, two truths are told as happy prologues to the swelling act of the imperial theme. He immediately connects the veracity of the first two proclamations with the certitude of the third, and nothing he has offered now that is not the kingship will satisfy his ambition. When Macbeth finally meets with Duncan, the king showers him with praise and promises of advancement using a gardening metaphor. I have begun to plant thee and will labour to make thee full of growing which Macbeth probably interprets to align itself with what he has been told by the witches, as the phrase full of growing could suggest the ultimate prize. Everything seems to be falling into place. Duncan's next words, however, dash his hopes, and he quickly takes his leave with the excuse that he wants to go ahead to warn his wife of the king's imminent arrival. Once he is alone, he reveals what he is really thinking. The Prince of Cumberland, that is a step on which I must fall down, or else or leap, for in my way it lies. Stars, hide your fires, let not light see my black and deep desires, the eye wink at the hand. The awakening of his ambition has blinded him to examining the witch's motivation for their prophecies. Rather than think to himself that they must be wrong, or that they have evil intentions, as warned by Banquo, or that perhaps he just needs to bide his time, he jumps to the conclusion that, in order for the prophecy to come true, he has to do something about it immediately. The way in which he says, that is a step on which I must fall down, suggests that now not having the crown for him amounts to failure. No longer a passive recipient of a prophecy, he must become active and change the course of fate to or leap the step that is in his way so that the prophecy can be self-fulfilled. He acknowledges that his ambitions or his desires are black and deep, as evil as they are profound, and that he will need to engage in subterfuge and deceit in order to fulfil them. The decision to murder Duncan in order to achieve his ambition, though, is not taken lightly by Macbeth. Although he very quickly thinks of murdering Duncan when he first hears the prophecy, if good, why do I yield to that suggestion, whose horrid image doth unfix my hair and make my seated heart knock at my ribs against the use of nature? 
the idea does horrify him, as evidenced by the powerful visual and visceral imagery he employs. At the start of the play, he is not a monster. Other than his ambition, he does have good qualities, and it seems unlikely that he would have gone ahead and murdered Duncan without the intervention of the witches in the first place. While he may be tempted by the idea of a single murderous act to gain the crown, if the assassination could trammel up the consequence and catch, with his surcease success, that but this blow might be the be-all and the end-all, and is willing to risk judgment in the afterlife for material gain in this one, here, but here upon this bank and shoal of time, we jump the life to come. He does wrestle with his conscience, as there are significant reasons for him to curb his ambitions. He's here in double trust, first as I am his kinsman and his subject, strong both against the deed, then as his host, who should against his murderer shut the door, not bear the knife myself. Not only is he related to Duncan, but he is also his subject, and as such he should be loyal. He cannot even justify it to himself on the basis that Duncan is a deficient monarch. Besides, this Duncan hath borne his faculties so meek, hath been so clear in his great office, that his virtues will plead like angels, trumpet-tongued against the deep damnation of his taking off. He finally admits to himself that his ambition is the only reason he has for considering the murder of Duncan. I have no spur to prick the sides of my intent, but only vaulting ambition which o'erleaps itself and falls on the other. He acknowledges the dangers of excessive ambition which he likens to a horse which jumps too high, only to fall on the other side of the fence. Ultimately, of course, he will go on to not heed his own warning. Lady Macbeth is a pivotal character who propels the plot. She is the driving force not only for Macbeth's ambition, but also for her own. She first appears alone in Act 1, Scene 5, and her soliloquies in this scene, which provide moments of drama and tension, reveal that she is probably even more ambitious than her husband, as she shows she is able to think and act alone. Women in the Jacobean era played a subordinate role to men, Expected to be pious and pure, their lives were restricted to the domestic sphere, dominated by taking care of the house and bringing up children. Lady Macbeth is the antithesis of the archetypal Jacobean woman, and her naked ambition would have been shocking for a contemporary audience. She knows that she does not have the power to control things independently. If she is to fulfil her ambition, which is conditional on Macbeth's, she will need to get him on side. Her resoluteness of purpose is a stark contrast to her husband's toing and froing. Her determination is shown through the definite future form shalt be. Glams thou art and cordor, and shalt be what thou art promised. She is, however, also a very good judge of character. She acknowledges that her husband is ambitious, but believes that this is insufficient without the willingness to commit evil deeds. Thou wouldst be great, art not without ambition, but without the illness should attend it. She fears that the only impediment to Macbeth's gaining the crown is his own weakness, which will prevent him from taking it by foul means. She recognises the need to give Macbeth her qualities to achieve the prophecy, and therefore her ambition, as she resolves to pour my spirits in thine ear, in order to eliminate his perceived weakness through her powers of rhetoric, and chastise with the valour of my tongue all that impedes thee from the golden crown. Ambition is associated in this play with being a man, or with having what were considered at the time the masculine qualities of bravery and cruelty. Lady Macbeth fears that Macbeth is too full of the milk of human kindness to catch the nearest way. 
The linking of milk with kindness in this metaphor suggests that she sees kindness as a peculiarly feminine trait, and that this is incompatible with ambition. Not only does she call on the spirits to unsex her, or to remove her femininity, and fill her from the crown to the toe top full of direst cruelty, but she later exhorts them to come to her woman's breasts and take her milk for gall, or to take an otherwise nourishing substance which is symbolic of her femininity, and transform it into its antithesis, a bitter poison. On more than one occasion, Lady Macbeth will accuse her husband of not being a man in order to shame him into agreeing to her scheme. He tells her that he no longer has a desire to go through with it. He hath honoured me of late, and I have bought golden opinions from all sorts of people, which would be worn now in their newest gloss, not cast aside so soon. Does Lady Macbeth really buy it when he tells her that his ambition will be satisfied with the lesser advancement that he has been promised? Or does she know that that would leave him forever dissatisfied? Are her harsh words designed to shame him into doing it for him or for her when she insults his manhood? When you durst do it, then you were a man. And to be more than what you were, you would be so much more the man. In this intricate piece of rhetoric, she inextricably links ambition with manhood. She says that if he dared to commit the murder, then he would be a man, and, in achieving his ambition to become king, he would be even more of a man than he was before. She finishes this speech with probably one of the most shocking and sickening images in the whole play, as she rails against what she sees as Macbeth's betrayal of his ambition. I have given suck, and know how tender it is to love the babe that milks me. I would, while it was smiling in my face, have plucked my nipple from his boneless gums and dashed the brains out, had I so sworn as you have done to this. Once more she returns to the image of women as nurturers, but she turns this on its head as she professes that she would willingly kill her own child as it fed at her breast, rather than not go through with it. It also effectively emasculates Macbeth by saying that he is weaker than a nursing mother. Although by the end of the scene Macbeth is in awe of her, saying, Bring forth men children only, for thy undaunted metal should compose nothing but males. Jacobean audiences would have been repulsed by Lady Macbeth's ambition and her reversal of sex roles, which would have been seen as unchristian. The way in which she invokes evil spirits to unsex her and how Macbeth hints that she has a masculine soul due to her ambition, links her in the mind of the contemporary audience to the diabolical presence of the witches, whose gender is also somewhat ambiguous, as signalled by Banquo when he says, somewhat facetiously, You should be women, but your beards forbid me to interpret that you are so. Shakespeare's attitudes towards ambition can be traced back to the popular perception of the time of the writings of Niccolò Machiavelli. Machiavelli was an Italian Renaissance writer and philosopher, most famous for his work The Prince, written in 1513. Machiavelli used his own experience as a diplomat to write a treatise on how to acquire and maintain power, which included a willingness to commit evil deeds if necessary even though moral behaviour was the preferred option. Machiavelli's work has, however, been gravely misunderstood, as it merely comprised his calm and dispassionate observations of what actually happened in politics, rather than an enthusiastic encouragement of what he would like to see happen. Even by the time Shakespeare was writing, Machiavelli, a Catholic, had been demonised as a man who, under the devil's influence, was driven to lead good men to their doom. And a Machiavel, to quote Shakespeare, was a character who was subtle or cunning, notorious and murderous, or someone who puts on a false appearance of virtue as a cover for their malevolent power-seeking. Ambition is a dirty word for Shakespeare. In his play Henry VI, Part Two. 
Gloucester declares that virtue is choked with foul ambition. When Malcolm and Donalbain are falsely suspected of plotting their father's murder, they are accused of committing a crime which is against nature still, thriftless ambition that will ravin up thine own life's means. Ambition is shown as an unnatural, self-destructive, self-defeating force, which is personified as being thriftless or wasteful, and which will ravin up or devour that which is necessary to give you life in the first place. Both the Macbeths can be described as Machiavels in the Shakespearean sense of the word, although it could be argued that Lady Macbeth is one right from the start, while Macbeth is forced into making Machiavellian choices due to the twists and turns of fortune which befall him. Machiavelli writes, He who is blinded by ambition raises himself to a position whence he cannot mount higher, must thereafter fall with the greatest loss. The fulfilment of his ambition brings Macbeth neither peace nor satisfaction as he laments, To be thus is nothing but to be safely thus. He becomes restless and insecure, appalled at the idea of losing the position he has so wrongly won and so dearly paid for to suffer an ignominious fall. He starts to see Banquo, who serves as a foil to him, as a threat, as his principled stance highlights Macbeth's own Machiavellian traits. He has already told Macbeth that he will do nothing immoral or disloyal to further either Macbeth's ambition or his own, when he agrees in principle to speak to him further about the prophecies. So I lose none in seeking to augment it, but still keep my bosom franchised and allegiance clear, I shall be counselled. And although he later expresses hope privately that his prophecy will come true, he does nothing to expedite it. Yet it was said it should not stand in thy posterity, but that myself should be the root and father of many kings. If there come truth from them, as upon thee, Macbeth, their speeches shine. Why, by the verities on thee made good, may they not be my oracles as well, and set me up in hope? Macbeth fears Banquo's moral integrity. Our fears in Banquo stick deep, and in his royalty of nature reigns that which would be feared. Not only this, but without an heir to continue his line, he finds his position meaningless. Not only is he paranoid and anxious, but he is also resentful of Banquo. For Banquo's issue I have filed my mind, for them the gracious Duncan I have murdered. This is not the ambition that he set out to fulfil, and so Banquo has to go. It does not, however, stop there. Machiavelli writes... Men rise from one ambition to another. First they seek to secure themselves against attack, and then they attack others. Macbeth becomes both greedy and selfish in his desperation to hold on to power, unwilling to share it with his wife, without whom he would not have won it in the first place, and his violent acts become ever more heinous as he desperately attempts to save his own skin. He tells his wife, I am in blood stepped in so far that should I wade no more, returning were as tedious as Gawar. He has perpetrated so much bloodshed that he has crossed a line. He has gone too far to be able to turn back. He must carry on wherever it takes him. Up to the murder and in its immediate aftermath, ambition unites the Macbeths to work as a unit, but afterwards it tears them apart. Lady Macbeth's power over her husband wanes as he sidelines her and acts independently. He refuses to tell her what he has planned for Banquo. Be innocent of the knowledge, dearest Chuck, till thou applaud the deed. And her exhortations to him to pull himself together at the banquet when he sees Banquo's ghost largely fall on deaf ears. Lady Macbeth has no more stage time until Act 5, Scene 1, and left to his own devices, Macbeth descends even further into moral depravity by ordering the murders of the innocent Lady Macduff and her children when the object of his fear is her absent husband. 
his ambition is now totally out of control. When Lady Macbeth appears again, she is sleepwalking, gripped by insanity. Her speech no longer the compelling rhetoric of a woman in control of her husband's ambition as well as her own, but an incoherent and incriminating mass of non-sequiturs which relive the murder and a testimony to the all-consuming guilt that racks her conscience. Her inevitable suicide takes place off stage, barely acknowledged by her former partner in crime. Ultimately, the brave Macbeth of Act 1, Scene 2, who managed to carve out his passage till he faced the slave Macdonald and unseamed him from the nave to the chaps and fixed his head upon our battlements, suffers the similar fate of the traitor at the hands of Macduff, who returns to the stage in Act 5, Scene 9, triumphantly brandishing his head. Malcolm, the rightful heir, duly ensconced on the throne, announces... What's more to do which would be planted newly with the time, as calling home our exiled friends abroad that fled the snares of watchful tyranny? His first job as part of overseeing a new age, he says, his gardening metaphor echoing that of Duncan's in Act 1, Scene 4, is to recall all those who have fled Macbeth's tyranny. Unfettered ambition, embodied in this dead butcher and his fiend-like queen, has been vanquished and equilibrium definitively restored. Thanks for watching. If you have any questions, please let me know in the comments section below and I'll do my best to answer them. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel for more videos on English language topics and exam techniques and English literature texts.